Cool. All right. Thank you all for being here. So this is going to be kicking off our Small Business Saturday, Side Hustle Saturday, Get Your Money Up, Not Your Funny Up Saturday, whatever you want to call it. All right. We're going to have different people coming in. I'm talking about different ways that you can make money outside of your regular nine to five. Um, some extra things you could do to boost yourself up. You know, we focus on trading, but there's other ways for you to grow and maintain a steady income and increase your revenue for yourself. So we're going to start off with Jake. Um, Jake is a 31-year-old from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He's currently a mortgage loan originator and has been working in banking and lending for eight years. He's going to discuss how to become a mortgage loan originator and how he next works and build connections to grow his business. So without further ado, I'll pass it on over to Jake. All right. Thanks, Jordan. Thanks for uh, having us on and, uh, like you said, uh, building our knowledge and and uh, kind of building our wealth together. Um, yeah, so like, like Jordan said, I'm a mortgage loan originator out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, kind of been doing this for um, kind of, I mean, banking and, and mortgage lending eight years together. And uh, when I started in banking, I was a personal banker. Um, and kind of did a little bit of mortgage lending and home equity loans and stuff like that. And uh, just realized that there's a lot more potential um, kind of switching over to more of a commission position with doing a mortgage lending uh, business. So I've been doing that uh, for a while now. And um, there's many ways kind of getting into it. Uh, I do it full time. I do have some colleagues and know some mortgage loan originators that they do it kind of whenever they want. Um, when I first started out, I did get, um, I did it online, kind of like if you've heard of companies probably like Rocket Mortgage or Better Mortgage. Um, a lot of their mortgage loan originators all are basically like call centers. So you can do it from home, especially since the pandemic hit. Um, they don't have you all just sitting in a call center all day. You can do it from home. Um, and that's kind of how I got uh, linked up with uh, the Discord and Jordan. Um, Instagram is how I found out about uh, the Discord. And um, since I had the ability to work from home and uh, have that extra time, um, I mean, it's a great way to build my wealth, um, being in the Discord and learning. So um, with the kind of basic ways of doing it, um, I'll share a, uh, it's called a NMLS. Um, so it's nationwide licensing, um, mortgage licensing. I'll share that in the uh, chat here. Uh, this is just kind of their main website. This is kind of how you would become licensed. Um, my company paid for it. Um, and a lot of mortgage companies do pay for it. Uh, but basically they go through like a little uh, background check. Uh, they ask for your education. And in, in each different state, there's a few different requirements. So currently I'm licensed in Wisconsin, uh, my home state, Illinois, North Carolina, Texas, and Florida. Um, and the main thing you have to pass is what's called a safe uh, test. Um, and for that, I believe I did like, it's been only maybe 12 hours of, uh, of courses. So it's like modules that you do online, you can do at your pace. Um, you just have to be in them a certain amount of time. So if you're quick with it, um, basically they make you sit and wait in the module for an extra minute or something if you're a fast reader um, to make sure that you're doing the courses for a certain amount of time. And then you have to do a proctored exam um, where I had to go in person and, and take this exam and pass it. I believe it's only a 75% that you have to pass it with um, in order to pass and, and get your license. So once you pass that, you can then get licensed anywhere and different states have uh, different requirements um, in terms of that exam. Um, and then like, for example, for Wisconsin, I had to do an additional two hours of training. So no additional exam really. I just had to do, uh, make sure they had my background uh, information from the NMLS. Um, I did have to do fingerprints for that. Um, and then they just verify your employment the last 10 years. Um, some states have like uh, different requirements on, on background exams. Um, some are more lenient. So that's something you can definitely look into and, and see what states have uh, kind of what requirements. Uh, I do know Florida and Texas are a little bit more um, a little bit more strict on their policies. Like I know I have a colleague that they can't get licensed there because they had a felony back when they were 18 doing some stupid stuff. Um, but, and, and that's unfortunate, but I mean, there's plenty of, of loans and deals that you can get done in, I mean, even in Wisconsin. So when I first started, I was only in Wisconsin and really working on building up my network and realtor uh, partners um, so that I can get uh, deals and loans. 
uh, more consistently once I stopped getting those leads online. So, um, so that's kind of how I am. I'm, I'm a hybrid kind of in between getting leads online. So if you think of like nerd wallet, um, credit karma, um, like guarantee rate, like people go online to shop rates. Um, when you're, when you're looking to buy a home that I used to basically get your information when you agreed to get a call and I would call you right away and say, Hey, this is what we can offer. And, um, and then if you wanted to go with me, you'd go with me. Um, and ever since the kind of mortgage industry the last year and a half has slowly kind of died down and with rates going up, it's hard for mortgage companies to be competitive in the market right now. Um, and, and it's almost kind of like mortgage companies now have like a niche market. So like, for example, I'll have a, a certain city in a state that they'll have really good rates in and they'll market to those, to those people, but they can't offer it everywhere. So they work on kind of where they're marketing and where they're getting those leads from um, to grow that. And then obviously, as you guys all know, networking is huge and kind of having those personal connections where you can just be there for your realtors, there for your family and friends, there for anybody that you know um, to kind of do a loan for. That's where you're going to get. Um, <clears throat> so in my situation, I get paid more on those because it doesn't cost the company any money to, to buy those leads and stuff like that um, in the commission. So um, like I said, multiple different ways that you can kind of go about it. I obviously do it full time. And um, I know some people that uh, they were with um, Rocket Mortgage and, and they did it full time just because the commission was so well. And I'm sure they aren't doing that now because rates are more than double they were two years ago. Um, but at the time, I mean, they were getting so many leads and so many refinances that uh, that they just kind of rolled with it, uh, even if they they didn't have that many uh, know that many people outside that that needed loans to be done. Um, so that's a little bit about kind of how to um, kind of get licensed and and different opportunities for that. Um, I would say my day to day to day. Uh, life. I mean, most people aren't, I mean, most people work during the day. So a lot of people don't have the time um, during the day to talk with. So I mean, a lot of my calls are um, evenings, weekends, and um, just kind of be available when they're available. So it's nice to have that flexibility when you need it. Um, but you're also kind of almost on call uh, a lot of the time too, depending on um, how you network and how you grow your business. So that's a nice thing about it. You can do your business how you want to do it. Um, and, and with my company, it's nice because they, they give you the support. Uh, they help you with kind of learning how to network, learning how to, um, I think a big thing now is is building your social media brand. Um, and just like how I found about it, this Discord, I'm working on now slowly building my own um, social media and following that way. Um, and I think that's that's kind of the way of, of the future in, in terms of those things. I mean, uh, getting your information out there, sharing your knowledge with people. Um, I mean, a lot of people obviously want the best rate in most situations, but uh, especially with first time home buyers that have no idea what's going on, like what a mortgage is and and why we do all this stuff that we do, why we require so much documentation and underwriting and um, title reports and kind of verifying anything that could be on their record or the seller's record of the home. Um, so I just like, that's kind of what I have my niche as is first time home buyers sharing my information, sharing them what the, what's all behind the mortgage. I mean, kind of what you hear um, in the news and, and online and on social media is what down payment is needed. What is the credit score needed? Those are really the only two things a lot of first time home buyers know is that they need a decent credit and they need a certain amount saved up. Um, where in reality, there's so many down payment assistance programs, so many grants out there. Um, I pre-approved somebody the other day for, they had less than a thousand dollars in their bank account. Um, so they had enough programs out there where with the down payment program um, and not having as much down, uh, yes, they're going to have a higher monthly payment, but their main goal is to get into the house. And, and I mean, they're already paying a lot for rent right now. So they're like, we want to be in the house and, and start building our equity, start building our wealth. Um, and that's kind of another reason I'm in 
this career is because I think uh, real estate's one of the, the real estate and the stock market are the two biggest ways of kind of creating your wealth. Um, being in banking for four or five, six years, all the people that had money were either a business owner, they owned real estate, or they did the stock market well where they knew what they were doing. Um, so those are, I mean, I'm in two of those right now, and maybe one day I'll, I'll eventually own my own business and maybe be in all three of those. But I mean, as Jordan says, every, as Moody says, as all everybody says in the Discord, I mean, you want to create more income streams, and hopefully this is one way that maybe some of you guys can can do that is um, slowly building that. I mean, right now it's hard as a mortgage loan originator. I think a lot of companies are still hiring, um, but in the industry there are also a lot of layoffs, just like you see in in the tech business right now. Um, just with rates going up, it's harder for uh, mortgage companies to keep their margins and, and pay people as much. Um, so there are a lot of layoffs too. So uh, kind of starting out, I mean, a lot of companies are commission only. So that's where you can potentially grow and get into this business is with a commission only. Um, so if you have that safety or uh, of a current job or something like that, it's kind of a nice side hustle or, or second job opportunity um, the one thing is with your background exam or, or background check, I mean, they do ask if you're employed elsewhere and that is known to the NMLS and all employers. So, uh, you just kind of have to be open and upfront with, uh, if you're looking to get into this industry that you are doing other things. Um, I have a coworker, he owns a, uh, a construction company and, and he does loans on the side. So he owns his company basically builds homes and he also, um, is a mortgage loan originator. So he's on two sides, almost referring uh, referring people to his own two businesses. Um, so there's a lot of ways you can go about it. You just kind of have to be open and upfront because it's all it's all in that background uh, background test when you when you first uh, looking looking to get licensed. Um, so if anybody has any questions on that, um, I, I'd love to answer. Uh, feel free to put them in the chat or I don't know if you can unmute or not. I'm not sure if you're gave everybody can, the capability. I'll let them unmute. Oh, question yeah. for me. So I, I worked in the mortgage industry previously and I did when I left, I was considering getting my license to be an MLO um, and holding it with different people. How, depending, I know you need to probably have a process or if you have a processor in-house, it probably makes this a ton easier. Um, but how likely would you say or how easy would it be for me once I get licensed, which is a process to essentially get paid because I know D Wiz is looking to buy a home in mm -hmm. my state. Hey, well, I'm licensed. Right. Yep. I can do his deal. How how easy would you think that process would kind of be? Yeah. So like to like to pass the test and stuff like that, you mean? And then well, after the after the test, right? After I get to yeah. say I don't want to do a lot of work. I want to get money, but I don't want to do a lot of work. Yeah. I, yep. I do the work up front, pass the test. Oh, D Wiz wants a house. Cool. Like, what's so, the so, process would be like that? Yep. So, and then I see somebody else did ask, how hard is the class to pass the test? So, I'll kind of answer both of those. Um, so, with the test, I mean, uh, I feel like it was fairly easy. I mean, only having seventy-five uh, percent, I feel like, is. Uh, um, I mean, that's not too hard of a of a passing grade. I feel like um, to obtain. Uh, there is one test where you can take to get licensed in all 50 states. That one I've heard is very difficult. Um, and uh, I haven't done that one or even looked into it just because uh, I don't know if it's necessary for me to be licensed in all 50 states and my company personally isn't licensed in all 50 states. So it just doesn't make sense for me to do. Um, and like you said, Jordan, I think uh, depending on your route you go, um, if you're looking at kind of helping family and friends and, and kind of going that route just to make it as easy as possible, getting a license in your home state is the best way to do it. Um, Cause you're going to have all those connections already in, in your state um, and know people. So the class, I would say not too difficult. It's really going through the modules. Um, I would say it's fairly a bit memory based. You have to kind of remember some rules and regulations, um, money laundering, stuff like that. And uh so I wouldn't say it's, it's too difficult. Um, I, if I rem remember correctly, I think it's, I can't remember if it's 250 or 350 for the safe exam 
and then each state um, has their own uh, charges as well. So I want to say it's around 100 to 150 for the states that I got licensed in. So all in, if you're just doing looking at one state less than 500 to get licensed and get licensed in that state. Um, and then, like you said, so if you're looking to just do kind of one deal here and there, that's going to be the hard part is finding a um, finding a company that will allow you to just kind of do deals at wherever. So for example, my company currently has a, um, a production standard. So I have to do a certain amount of loans a month to kind of basically for them to cover my licenses. So that's a nice thing. They cover my licensing, but I have to meet certain requirements. So there are companies out there that you pay for your own licenses, you pay for your own marketing stuff and, and everything. Um, but then you have that flexibility where you don't have to do it as a full-time job and, and do a certain amount of deals. Um, so that that's going to be your, in that situation, Jordan, that's going to be where it'll be kind of up to the company, I think. Um, because once, I mean, once you have somebody, I think the mortgage process for the most part, if it's a very simple, um, so the three big, biggest things you look for in a loan is income so that you can, and your debts. So it's called your debt to income ratio. So you take your monthly debt payments, including your projected mortgage, homeowners insurance, property taxes, divided by your gross income. Um, that has to be under 50%, uh, which I think is very high. I mean, that's a gross income. Once you take out all your taxes and everything, that's more like 60 to 75% of your income that you're allowed to have go towards your mortgage, which I think personally is pretty crazy. Um, so I normally tell, recommend people, what's your budget? And then I go that route and say, hey, what, what is your budget? What do you feel comfortable with a monthly payment for? Because most people think it's only your principal and interest, but you got to add in your homeowner's insurance, property taxes. Um, if you're not putting 20% down, you have an additional mortgage insurance because you're more of a risk to the company. Um, and then, uh, and then if they have, so debt to income ratio and then loan to value. So that's how much they're putting down. Um, like I said, there's so many different programs out there, um, that you can look at doing three and a half, five percent down minimum is, is usual, um, depending on FHA or conventional. And then from there, so, um, and then their credit. So in most situations, 640 is minimum credit for conventional and 600, um, sometimes 580, we can go to for an FHA for your credit score. Um, if you have those three things, um, under 50% debt to income ratio, at least 5% down and a 640 credit. I mean, for that scenario, Jordan, that's easy to get them pre-approved and then they can buy a home and you just kind of plug in all their numbers and the systems that these companies have for your mortgage. They even calculate what, um, what that home value is that they can afford. Um, and like I said, a lot of times, um, at least for what I do, uh, a lot of times what they can afford is more than they, what they actually want, just because, um, just because you're allowed 50% of your gross income to be a, a monthly payment. And if you're going FHA, 55%. So um, I'm not sure if that answered your question. I know it was a lot kind of rambling on, but. <laughs> do you, as I see you uh, had a question about VA loans. So yeah, VA loans, um, those are, so there's VA loans and USDA loans. Uh, those are a lot of people. VA is very well known, USDA not so much. VA is 0% uh, down for veterans that have served in the military at some point. Um, if you are a veteran, you have what's called a certificate of eligibility. Um, and that uh, will, that along with what you can get pre-approved for um, to purchase, that will let you know what is covered by the VA. Um, so it's, uh, it's a government backed and, and partially insured loan. So because of that, um, there's uh, uh, more reason or, or less strict guidelines um, to be uh, um, to be approved for. So zero percent down is the minimum um, uh, for like. So usually you have to pay for an appraisal. Uh, an appraisal can't be charged to a veteran. So we have to somehow go different ways about it um, to have those come be paid for. So a lot of times either the, the lender, like my company would pay for it, 
or there's what's called seller's concessions. So that's where when the market was crazy two, three years ago, it was almost sad to see, but veterans weren't getting their offers approved because um, sellers have to sometimes pay for some of those fees because veterans aren't allowed to pay for fees um, with what VA requirements are. So FHA and VA or, or government-backed programs weren't getting um, their offers accepted because so many people were coming in with cash offers or conventional offers and having, and as a seller, you'd rather have somebody that has better credit and, and somebody else buying their, buying their home where they know for sure there's less of a chance that throughout the mortgage process that they would not be, um, that anything would go wrong. Um, anything else on VA? I'm trying to think. Um, I think that's pretty much it. So certificate of eligibility. There, actually, one thing is a lot of lenders don't let you know this. Um, so yes, you have 0% down on a VA, but there's something that's called a, an upfront funding fee um, that is usually about 1% of your loan amount. So if you have a $200,000 loan amount, there's a $2,000 fee added into your loan that most people don't tell you about. It's just kind of added to your, to your mortgage loan amount. Um, and uh, my brother-in-law is actually a veteran and he had no idea. He bought a home and he was charged $4,000 extra just because, I mean, it's, it's part of the fee. I mean, but he wasn't aware of it because he doesn't know how to break down a loan estimate or closing disclosure and, and see that that fee's in there. I mean, unless you are very detailed, most people just sign a closing disclosure. They don't really go through it. Um, and, and that's one thing that I kind of pride myself on is kind of going through that in very uh, specific detail so that everybody knows where these charges are coming from um, and stuff like that. So uh, I would say working with first time home buyers a lot, most people only think your payments, of, uh, a, uh, um, principal and interest just on your mortgage. But like I said earlier, you have your property taxes, your homeowner's insurance, your mortgage insurance. Um, I would say, um, kind of breaking it down. So a lot of times your lender is going to have a lender fee that a lot of people don't know about. That ranges anywhere from I would say five hundred to three thousand dollars. I know Rocket Mortgage is uh, very well known for charging a very high lender fee. I've seen sometimes five or six thousand dollars by them. Um, basically, just because they're a well-known company, they'll charge you five thousand dollars just because you know that they're going to get your deal done. The nice thing is that they do do it fast. So if you're in a situation where you need to close in fourteen days and move in fourteen days, they're going to get it done. I mean, nowadays, most companies, like my company, I closed somebody, I got them in their house in 13 days. Most companies are going to be able to do that now because they know the significance of it. And, and especially with realtors out there, like how many realtors are out there, like just in Milwaukee itself, there's over 5,000 realtors in Milwaukee. Like that's crazy. Um, and the thing is, I mean, yes, maybe a lot of them do one or two deals a, a, a year, um, similar to like what Jordan's saying, like some of them probably just do it on the side. They want to just help out their family and friends and, and make the two, 3% off that. I mean, that's a good side hustle too. Um, and then, uh, and then what else goes into that? So you have your title companies, they do like a background check on yourself. They do a background check on the seller and they do a background check on that property. So typically, um, if they're depending on when the home was sold last, they can go back just to that date of the sale, uh, depending on what that other title company did. Sometimes they'll have to go back the full kind of history of that home. It's so like my home that I bought was built in 1923. That's almost 100 years ago. Um, so depending on when that title search was done last, they have to go back to a certain amount of time, make sure there's no delinquencies or liens on the property. Um, like for example, um, if um, it's not too popular here in Wisconsin, but in um, southern states, um, in California especially, uh, solar panels are very popular. Getting putting those on homes, those typically you put a lien on your home. So in a lot of situations, um, if you default on that uh, solar panel um, loan, they can take your home. Um, but it also uh, is an issue when you're doing a mortgage because then if you're doing like a refinance or a purchase, there's a lien on that property. So we either have to pay that off or get what's called a 
uh, what's called a subordination from that solar or whatever company is owning that loan saying, hey, we're putting this mortgage in front of your lien. So if this, if this borrower ever defaults on their loans, we have first priority to do something about it over the solar company or whatever company has that loan for the solar panels. Um, so that's kind of what title does. And in most situations, I've seen that ranging from 1,000 to $3,000, um, depending on the city, state, um, and everything like that. And from, what's next on that list? Um, we have uh, um, appraisals covered in that too. Uh, in most situations that ranges from, I would say about 600 to $800. Um, if any of you guys have gotten a mortgage or done refinance in the last, uh, about two years ago or so, uh, appraisers can kind of choose what their rates are and they don't have to tell us. So like I had a couple times where appraisers were like, oh, we're gonna charge $1,500 for this just because we can, because we're so busy right now. Cause so everybody wanted to refinance and get a two, 3% rate on their mortgage. Um, so, I mean, unfortunately either the borrowers like, I, I wanna pay that or I don't wanna pay that. So the nice thing is a lot of companies will put a, we'll put it in your disclosures that I normally do 795. So $795 for the appraisal. If it's above that, then the appraiser has to come back to us and say, Hey, this is what it's going to cost. It's going to cost more than that. We need to get the borrower's approval before we can move forward with that. So they can either wait and hold off on it, or they can move forward with a higher price appraisal. Um, and then uh, credit reports, uh, those normally cost about $60. If you're doing a, if you're doing a joint, I think thirty dollars for a single person, and um, and then other costs that go into it are your homeowner's insurance. So if you're buying a house, you have to put one years of homeowner's insurance up front into your closing costs. So usually, I normally uh, advise about a hundred dollars a month, so about twelve hundred dollars a year. You're adding on to your closing costs, and then uh, if you don't put twenty percent down, you have to escrow. Uh, your mortgage, which means that within your mortgage payment, you put in um, your homeowner's insurance and your property taxes into your mortgage payment. And we have to create a, um, a escrow fund to make sure we have a, a surplus on, in that just in case your property taxes go way up one year or your homeowner's insurance goes way up one year. So we do a three month buffer for those. So if you're doing $100 a month in uh, homeowner's insurance, I would say depending on your area, in my area, it's pretty 350 to $400 a month in property taxes. So $500 a month, $1,500, we have to create an additional closing cost to cover an escrow fund. And then you do have the option to buy down your rates um, as well as a lot of people are doing that now with rates being so high, they're buying down their rate. So you pay 1,000, 2,000, $3,000 to buy your rate down. Um, and depending on the day, the costs different all the time. So um, all in all, your closing costs on top of your down payment, you're typically looking at one to 3%. I would say on the very minimum side of things, it would be probably about three to $4,000. Um, and a lot of, like I said, right now we're at least in, in Wisconsin and, and in the market that I'm in, everything's very local. So right now, Sellers have, a, or buyers have a little bit, it's a little bit of a buyer's market, but it's, it's slowly shifting back towards the seller's market um, with it now coming out of the winter. Um, and we've had a pretty mild winter up here too. And um, so it's slowly shifting back to a seller's market where in a buyer's market, you can get seller's concessions um, where they can basically cover some of your closing costs. And you always have to cover your own down payment unless you do, you have a certain uh, specific down payment assistance assistance program, but you can have the seller cover your closing costs, which can save you, like I said, anywhere from two to two to five thousand dollars and in some situations if you're buying the rate down even more. So D Wiz, I saw your question about uh, other uh, homes or properties. So yeah, so I mean, there's all different types of loans out there that you can work on and it depends on what you kind of want to kind of have your niche in. So I, like I said, I kind of work with mostly uh, first time home buyers um, and uh, like single family homes, sometimes duplexes, three, four units, depending on if they want a house hack and 
and buy one property and rent out the other units. Um, but we also do like manufactured homes, modular homes. Um, some companies do like lot loans. We don't do those unless you're going to be building on it. So we do construction loans as well. So if you're looking to buy a lot and then build a home, um, we can help you with that. Um, when I was in banking, I primarily did home equity lines of credit. So what that is, is if you have enough equity built up in your home, you can borrow against that equity at a much lower rate than like a personal loan or using a credit card. Um, uh, I don't do those anymore. Our company doesn't do those. We broker those out to another company if somebody wants to do those. Um, but uh, that's kind of the majority of the loan origination I do with different types of homes and different types of properties. Yeah, I mean, I would say that. I mean, so kind of how I got interested in it um, in real estate and, and in mortgage is one of my good buddies from high school, his parents owned a, a real estate company. So they've been, and he's been in the business for, um, I mean, he started before he was even in college. So he started when he was 18 being a realtor and he's like the most well-known realtor in uh, that area of, of where he lives. Um, so if he's grown to know many investors and, and people, um, uh, people, uh, I'm sorry, somebody just messaged me here. Um, so if people are looking to invest, so the hard part is with investors, a lot of investors have, if, if they're good at what they're doing, they have the cash to kind of buy homes in cash um, where they don't do as many loans. And the other hard part is, especially with rates right, right now, investment loans are all, um, are all, uh, all at least a percent higher rate than like a normal uh, personal home. So with rates where they are at, it's hard for uh, people to, it's hard for investors to kind of get a, a, a deal done right now, especially with home prices rising and with rates rising. So, I mean, I would say if you can, if you have friends that will, that are willing to pay the price and, and know eventually that rates are going to come down and know eventually that, um, that, that uh, cash flow will come through from an investment property. Yeah. I would say that's easy money. I mean, friends and family, I would say are the two are easy money for buying a home and, and refinancing. So um, when I first started doing originations and getting commission on it, I, I got in just at the back end of when rates were low. So I didn't have too much exposure to the two, 3% where unfortunate for me, I'm missing that commission. But uh, I still think eventually right now we're right around 6% on a, um, it, with excellent credit and, um, and excellent income on a personal uh, property. Um, so I would say that's, uh, that's easy money um, if, you, if you had that networking group. And I mean, even if you, like for say, I network with realtors and try to get out to networking events, uh, main way I do that, I mean, social media is one big way. Um, a lot of people post um, on LinkedIn, different networking events. Um, and, and just kind of going out there and, and introducing yourself to people, letting people know what you do. Um, that's the biggest thing, just getting your, your name out there and, and letting people know what you do, what, what you're able to help out with. Um, and a lot of times when you have those, uh, when you have those relationships, they don't even care what the rate is. They just know that you're going to do a good job. Um, obviously if you're with a company that's charging, uh, like rocket mortgage, charging an absurd amount of, uh, origination fees, um, people may not work with you then, but I mean, with Rocket Mortgage, they have such a, a well-known uh, company name that you don't you don't need to necessarily help out your friends and family. And in that aspect, if I did work for them, I don't know if I would want that my friends and family to do loans with me <laughs> because I know how uh, how much they're getting gouged on that. Um, you need seventy-five percent on the test. I feel it depends on how good you are with education material. Definitely. I mean, I. Uh, I feel like when I took the exam, I was only a couple of years out of college. So I, I mean, college is all about taking tests. So I feel like I was still um, pretty, pretty good at taking tests at the time. Um, I mean, that's what school is, is getting you good to take tests. 
I don't know that you learn much unless you're really passionate about it. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're good at taking tests, it's not going to be, not going to be an issue at all for the, the safe test. So uh, Matt, for this question here. Yeah, I think he missed it. Um, so just kind of to the, to the overall idea of, um, like the average person, right? Like, you know, me or Lindsay, you know, Rosa, some of the people in the chat, um, uh, it would be pretty lucrative if I am, if I'm cool with multiple realtors, right? If I have multiple people in my family or friends who are realtors, then we could partner mm -hmm. on deals. If I know people who are real estate investors, um, then I would kind of already have like clientele. Exactly. Oh, uh, and then from there, it's just a matter of processing the mortgage. And if I'm getting what, 2%, <clears throat> 2% on a $200,000 loan. Yep. Yeah. So typically you're normally getting, so if you're commission only, it's usually right around 1% is the, okay. Um, for, for a mortgage loan originator is pretty typical. Um, and then it ranges from there. So like I get paid less on, um, the leads that I, uh, I receive from my company, but if you're, if you're doing all your own networking, if you're commission only 1% is usually a good, uh, good rule of thumb. Um, when I was first looking, uh, this was three years ago now, 1.25% was, I was offered, but that they didn't really have any, um, any structure or anything like that. So typically 1% is the, is kind of a good area to look at, uh, what your commission would be. And they go on basis points. So 100 basis points is 1%. Um, and, uh, they would, uh, if they go above that, usually that means that they're charging additional fees to your borrowers. So good rule of thumb for that, Jordan, is if you know some realtors, if you know some investors, maybe even ask them around to say, hey, what companies do you work with and um, to do your loans or, or financing and stuff like that. And that would give you a good way to, I mean, they might, if they do enough, like if they do enough referral business to those companies, they might be able to get a, put a good word of, uh, put a good a good word in for you to get hired there too. So, um, but they also know kind of what they're charging and, and what they're getting there too. Um, so Matt, yeah, sorry, I did see your question. It was just sent to me directly. Um, so Matt's question was, so can't, you can't be a felony or ever stole or embezzled money like on a real estate agent background check. Yeah. So if, it depends on the state. Um, so like I said, for example, Florida and Texas, if you have a felony, they won't approve the, your background check. You won't be uh, approved there. Unfortunately, I'm not licensed in Georgia, so I'm not too familiar with what their requirements are um, and if they allow that or not. Um, I know like Wisconsin, Illinois, and North Carolina, you are allowed to have a felony. Um, it just has to be a certain number of years past that felony. Uh, Matt, I'm an investor, but I use cash buyers 90% of the time. I can always find retail buyers on wholesale deals. Exactly. Yeah. Most investors right now with where our rates are at, they're cash buyers right now. Um, so, I mean, that doesn't help me, but it helps realtors. So, I mean, if you know an investor as a mortgage loan advisor or mortgage loan originator, um, and you want to network with realtors, that's a great way to, to get them on your side is referring business to them. Um, understandable, Matt. <laughs> um, D was what's the uh, current sentiment on the housing market during the past few years? Some homes have doubled in value or more. Are you seeing a correction in the market ongoing or coming soon? So that's uh, a great question. So I personally, especially in my market in Wisconsin, I do not see home values dropping. And if they do drop very slightly, um, and uh, I follow, so one of the biggest people on social media is, uh, is his handle, I think is What's a Mortgage. Uh, he's out in California. So he, he harps on this and, and I agree to it. It's all about your local market. So unless, and that's why another big reason, if you're looking to get licensed, potentially getting licensed in your state, you can just be so much more knowledgeable on that market than if like, I mean, I know I'm, in, I'm licensed elsewhere. Um, I, I know the market because I have realtor uh, partners in those markets, but outside of that, I'm, I don't live there. I don't see the day to day. I don't, I don't know them as well as I know Wisconsin. 
Um, so that's, that's the biggest thing is, is knowing your local market. Um, but the biggest thing I would say with, uh, going back from like looking at the housing crash back in 2008 and going to today, there were on average, I think in 2006, 2007, 2008, I believe it was four to $5 million homes or four to 5 million homes available on the market. And right now we're under a million on the market, uh, on an average 30 day span. So we have way less inventory now than we did in 2006, 2007, 2008, when that crash came. The other thing is um, the age of, of people. So if you look back 30 years from now and going, um, that's when there were the most people born in a five year span. So for the next, I would say at least two, three years, uh, the average age of a first time home buyer, I believe is 32 years old, which I thought was kind of high. Um, but also understandable. Um, but with that age, that's where there are more and more and more people becoming into their thirties and looking to be a first half home buyer. So there's so much more demand than inventory out there right now. And I think it's going to stay that way for at least two, three years. And then if you look back at how many, look back 30, 32 years at how many births there were, um, that's when they start to decline is, is in, another about two, three years. Um, so that's where we could potentially see a little bit of a decline um, if that was the only aspect that, that would create the housing market to decline. But again, it will depend on where rates are at. It will depend on um, how many homes are being built. Um, that's the other thing. There's so few homes being built right now that it's basically everybody, all investors want to invest in our luxury rentals. I mean, why would they build a, a single family home um, when they can build a uh, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 unit property and have that cash flow come in immediately and, and make so much more money? Obviously, they're going to need a lot more capital, but that's what a lot of uh, a lot of these bigger hedge funds and bigger companies are investing in are these uh, luxury and uh, rental units. Um, I did see an article recently where um, JP Morgan is looking to is looking to invest a billion dollars in the single family market um, in, in buying and building. So that could potentially help. Um, and, and that's another difference from 2006, 2007, 2008 as well than, than now is that there were so many more builders and so many homes being built. And, and right now there's just not that many builders out there building homes. So, so back, back to the original question, D was, I, I don't think there will be much of a correction. Um, and if there are, I don't, I don't see it, it downturning much. Um, I see it more kind of tapering off and going back to uh, your home value growing at a two or 3% yield um, compared to in the last, um, last couple of years, it was closer to eight, nine, 10%, depending on your market. So just kind of tapering off in, in home values increasing year over year. So, I mean, that's pretty much all I have, unless anybody has uh, any other questions or if they want me to go over any other type of scenario or, or anything in the, in the mortgage industry. Ooh, thank you, Jake. Yeah. Thank you. Jake. Yeah. So hopefully I, I gave you guys a little bit of knowledge and um, like I said, I think it's a very lucrative career. Um, when I originally got into uh, mortgage lending, I, uh, I was a personal banker um, and one of my clients was a mortgage lender and I saw how much he was bringing in a month. I'm like, Jesus, I need to get into that. I need to get into that instead of doing what I'm doing. Um, he was making forty, fifty thousand dollars a month. Um, I'm like, all right, I got to make the switch. And obviously I'm not making that right now, but, uh, um, hopefully one day. <laughs> hey, in time, bro. In time.